Okay, so story time. So basically one time in fifth grade, my dad took me to get breakfast from Dunkin' Donuts. We went there before school like always. And as we were there, this strange man outside was staring at me and like making faces. Super creepy. We didn't know him or anything, so we walked inside and I was kind of freaked out. I told my dad that I was creeped out by him and he told me that nothing bad was going to happen. Or so he thought. So we got our foods and we ate it. Everything was fine, you know, chill. After we were done, we got up to leave. The man was gone by now, so I felt better and... But then on the way to my school, I saw him walking on the sidewalk. Like, I figured he was going to his house or, like, somewhere else. When we got to my school, no one was outside. It was kind of weird. We went to open the door because my dad was a part of the PTA, so he came in with me. The door, for some reason, was locked. My music teacher out of nowhere ran out and brought us inside quickly. She told us that our whole school was on code red. Uh, scary! And that a man was in our school, so we went inside and I went and hid in the music room. Like for part two! Okay, story time. <laughs> so I work at a jewelry store and today a man came in looking for a gift for his wife for their 10th year anniversary. He ended up picking out a piece that said, my beautiful wife. And I said, anything else for you today? And he said, no, that's it for her, but I do want to make another purchase using a separate credit card. And could you possibly create a different account for me? And I said, sure, what are you looking for? And he said, do you have anything that says girlfriend? And I said, yes. And he said, perfect, I'll take it. And do you have anything that says happy one year anniversary to go with it? And I said, Yes. And he said, perfect, I'll take it. So I boxed everything up all nice and I put them in their respected bags. He had me mark a K for Kristen on the bottom of his wife's bag and an L for Laura on the bottom of his girlfriend's bag. I put pretty bows on them. I handed it to him. I said, they're going to love it. Have a nice day. And he said, thank you. And shit, I just remembered that his wife's name is Laura and his girlfriend's name is Kristen. I must have mixed up the bags. Oops. Story time about how my boss severely bullied me because she was envious of me. This clearance is not my story time, it was sent to me on Instagram. I work at a really high-end nail salon. I'm talking about two to three hundred dollars per manicure and pedicure. So it's very high-end and our clientele is very rich. My goal has been to open my own nail salon, but it hasn't happened yet. Obviously, I don't have enough money to open it, so I needed to get a job. This new nail salon had opened up near my house. It was the prettiest thing I'd ever seen in my life, so I definitely wanted to get a job there. I went in for an interview with the owner of the nail salon. During the interview, she was really nice, but kind of gave off that queen bee vibe like she was the popular girl and she didn't want anyone else to be popular or pretty i got a call from her a week later and she asked me if i could do her nails to see how well i did and when i did her nails she was impressed she said that I was really good and that I was hired immediately. I started working and within the first month, I had the biggest clientele list. A lot of clients were asking for me to do their nails. And when other clients heard the other clients asked for me, they also started asking for me. You know, word of mouth. I was extremely proud of myself. Not only was I making a lot of money, but I was actually building a clientele base that really loved my work. Don't get me wrong, the other girls at the salon were actually really good. And so was the owner. If we were really busy, sometimes the owner would pick up any walk-in clients. And one of the walk-in clients came in and asked specifically for me. The owner told her that I was busy and that she would do her nails. That's when the girl said that she would come back whenever I was available. My boss quickly snapped at the girl and told her that she was just as good as I was. The worst part was that she said it loud enough so that everyone in the salon could hear her. The client clearly felt uncomfortable but agreed to it anyway. Later that day on my break, I could hear my boss talking in the kitchen. I decided to wait outside and see what she was saying. Sure enough, she was talking about me and telling one of the other girls that I thought I was too pretty for this job and that I didn't have any experience. She also said that I probably just watched YouTube videos in order to learn number one i have 10 years of experience and number two it doesn't matter if you watch youtube videos as long as you're learning this obviously hurt my feelings and i tried not to cry then i realized that she did it on purpose she was speaking really loudly and she knew that i was about to go on break that's when i realized that she was definitely trying to bully me the following day i get a phone call from her telling me that i should stay home when i asked her why she said that she hired a new girl and she said in fact don't come at all this week and she basically hung up on me part two is up If you guys want to talk about the worst mom in the history of moms, let's talk about the case of Diane Downs, who literally attempted to murder all three of her children in order to get a man to fall in love with her. So what exactly creates a monster like this? Well, Diane was born August 7th of 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona. Most of her life, she was pretty well behaved, but she started to rebel against her parents around high school. She cut her hair, had a really edgy phase, and got super boy crazy. And she started to date guys, which was way outside of her strict family's rules. And she fell in love with a boy named Steve Downs. They were high school sweethearts, but the second the college hit, they ended up going separate ways. He joined the Navy, and she went to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. And while they said that they would stay faithful to each other, she immediately started to hook up with other guys when she got there, and was expelled for her promiscuous behavior. 
and had to go back and live with her strict parents. While Steve came back, he forgave her and they ended up running away together and getting married on November 13th of 1973. They were known to fight constantly. But in 1974, they had their first child together, making everything worse. Story time about how my parents caught me selling my undies online. Disclaimers is now my story time of sending me on Instagram. I'm extremely, extremely spoiled. My family is extremely rich. This allows me to buy whatever I want. The problem is my dad caught me sneaking out of my window, so he grounded me for two months and took away my allowance. And my allowance is a lot. My dad usually gave me $150 a week. With that money, I would go to Starbucks every single day before school. And I would also treat my friends to Starbucks every now and then. More like every day. My friends and I would go to restaurants and have fancy dinners and lunches. And I also had a car. I would also go shopping almost every single Friday with my friends. I would get manicures and pedicures. And I could basically buy myself whatever I wanted just by asking my dad for the money. But now that I was grounded, that was not going to happen. By the way, I'm 20 now, but this was three years ago, so I was 17 when all of this happened. I can confidently say that I was like the queen bee in my high school. Number one, I was in the cheerleading squad. Number two, I was super pretty popular and had lots of money. Therefore, everyone wanted to hang out with me. I knew that I needed to maintain my status and also the life that I had become accustomed to. Not being able to go to Starbucks every single morning really made me depressed. That probably made you roll your eyes, but I said what I said. Now, there was no way I was going to go get a job somewhere. You would never catch me working at a cafe or a restaurant or something like that so I knew I had to start making my own money online somehow I did some research and found out that people would sell pictures and video of their feet so I signed up for this stupid website and decided to do it the problem was that by the end of the week I had only made $46 this was clearly not enough so I did some more research and found out that you could actually sell your undies so I took my last $200 went to Victoria's Secret and stocked up on undies and this is when things get really fun part two is up Story time of how I found out that my mom was actually my older sister. My older sister never really liked me as a child. We were never close. I never knew why, but I was guessing it was because of the 10 year age gap. But I'm pretty sure she hated me because she couldn't even look me in the eye. I cannot make this up. She would not look me in the eye. But she never really talked to my parents either. She kind of just kept to herself all the time. Sometimes I have vivid memories of when we were younger and she would always be arguing with my parents about something and I always thought it had something to do with me. Well, I was right. It had everything to do with me because eventually my sister turned 18 and she moved out. For two years, I didn't talk to her at all. I honestly don't even think I had her number saved. And I'm pretty sure that she didn't have mine. Well, two years later, and I was 10 at the time, she reached out to me via social media. I'm not sure how she found my Instagram name, but it was just my name, so she probably just typed that in and found me. She DM'd me and told me that she wanted to talk about something very important and that she would like to talk over the phone. So we exchanged numbers and we called that same night. And she told me that when she was younger, my dad had taken advantage of her and gotten her pregnant. Story time on how I sold my farts in a jar and made big money. Okay, so boom, let's get right into it. So I'm extremely broke. And because I'm broke, I did what many people would do and went to Google. I looked up ways to make money when you're dead broke as a woman. Dancers came up and also fans only and even selling my intimates. But I served the Lord, so I didn't want to do anything involving my body in a sexual way. No judgment, by the way, just not for me based on my beliefs. Well, anyways, I stumbled across a page of a woman. I don't know if she prefers her identity to be hidden, so let's just call her Hannah Montana. Well, Hannah Montana explained how she made 70 case selling her farts and it immediately one shocked me and two piqued my interest now this was something i could do i had to start my fart journey like for part two some men are absolutely disgusting like yuck 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 oh my god so you know i was just at the gym you know being a baddie trying to build a fatty bitch and there's a guy working out next to me and all of a sudden a girl passes by and like he doesn't even look at her like doesn't look at her face just looks at her ass and like stares for a good 30 seconds like a weirdo like a straight 30 second like i understand peeking like 10 seconds but 30 seconds just straight and you know there's nothing wrong with checking a girl out because some of these girls out here be like they be making you break your neck just to look at them because they're bad bitches so it's well deserved but the problem is this man had the audacity to look at his friend and be like that's a hard sex and then he started criticizing everything about this girl's body even down to the fucking leggings she was wearing oh my god but then bitch it got worse because then i started noticing that they were following different girls around the gym while they were doing their workouts and they were rating them and critiquing them as to why they wouldn't or would smash like what the fuck and in my head, I'm like, first of all, y'all are hard for us. I don't know why y'all talking when you look like the creepy uncles at the barbecue, bitch. 
I was in class on Zoom. I wanted to go to sleep, honestly, because like when I'm tired, I go to sleep. I end up falling asleep and then class ends and everyone starts leaving the class, except me, because I was like in a whole other universe at this point. I was dreaming, I was flying. At this point, me and the teacher are alone in the call. This is the best part. <laughs> then the teacher starts talking to me and he's like, Samantha, wake up. Samantha, please. Samantha, you have another class. He woke me up, but I was half awake, so I didn't really know what was going on. So I thought it was my brother waking me up, and I straight up yelled. I was like, shut up, you fat booger. And so then I realized, oh shit, I just called my teacher a fat booger. And now he scheduled a parent conference. Um, I'm going on Monday, so I'm really excited. <laughs> Am I the a-hole for kicking my brother-in-law out after he referred to himself as the father of my child? Let me explain. I'm a 30-year-old female and my wife is a 29-year-old female. We welcomed our son into the world a year ago and both of our families are very accepting of us, but my wife's family has this weird obsession with passing on the family genes. So this made adopting out of the question very early on. My wife and I always wanted to start a family, but things got difficult when my wife found out that she was infertile. We knew that her family would be understanding, but I am terrified of pregnancy. My biological mom died in childbirth, which has led me to believe that I wouldn't hold a pregnancy very well. After a few months of brainstorming, my mother-in-law suggested that we do IVF, using my eggs, my brother-in-law's sperm, and let my wife carry the baby. Even though I was skeptical, I gave in because the plan hit all the marks. Her family got to pass on the genes, and my wife and I got to start a family. Plus, I didn't want to carry the baby. We went through extensive counseling and therapy to make sure everyone was on the same page and could handle it, and everything went great. My wife loved being pregnant, aside from the morning sickness. And we were overjoyed to welcome our new baby boy in the winter. But a problem arose when we were preparing for my son's first birthday when my brother-in-law made a comment about how he should get a say in the planning as the child's father. I was shocked, I cringed, and I told him he wasn't. And told him that he was just providing a piece of him, and he looked me in the eye and said, yeah, so he's our child. My wife's jaw dropped and my mother-in-law wasn't making eye contact. I kicked him out of the house and told him that he couldn't come back until he apologized. But he got angry, which made my wife start to cry. She has always struggled with self-esteem, and this infertility really took a toll on her. For months, I've had to reassure her and tell her what an amazing mom she is. My sister-in-law later that day called me the B-word, and I argue that my brother-in-law had no right saying any of that. But she kept yelling, so my wife and I had to cut off contact with her family. Brother-in-law signed away all of his rights and agreed multiple times he's just an uncle. But am I in the wrong for waiting for him to apologize? Story time about how my boyfriend gave me sleeping pills before his boy's night out. I had been dating my boyfriend for a year and we always had a pretty trusting relationship. One weekend, he was going to have a boy's night out with his friends and I was going to stay home. However, earlier in the day, we had gone into an argument about how he never checks his phone while he's out or replies to my text to check in. He said he shouldn't have to check in with me while he's out and I disagreed because I just want to make sure that he's okay. Fast forward to later that night when he's getting ready, I told him that even though we're fighting, I still expect him to keep in touch with me. He agrees this time without putting up a fight and asks me if I want to have a drink with him before he goes. He makes us some cocktails and we drink them together while we wait for his friends to come pick him up. When his friends get there, he kisses me goodbye and leaves. Not even half an hour later, I'm knocked out cold. I remember waking up once just for a second to use the bathroom, but then knocking out again. In the morning when I woke up, he was asleep next to me and I was really confused as to why I slept so much when I wasn't even tired. When my boyfriend woke up, he mentioned how nice it was that I hadn't messaged him and how I must have slept through the night after those cocktails. This raised some red flags and I quickly questioned him about what was in the cocktails. At first, he called me crazy and told me that he didn't do anything to them. However, after about 20 minutes of accusing him, he finally confessed. Story time on how protecting my kids landed me in jail. Okay, so boom. I have two daughters who I really love and they're the type of girls who are uh, extra. My youngest is 16, my oldest is 18, and I myself am 38. Now when I say my kids are extra, I mean they don't hold back how they feel. If they don't like something, they express themselves and that's a blessing and a curse. But on this particular day, it was a curse. So one day we were at Walmart and I was in the kitchen section. Then all of a sudden, my kids come running to me with a man running after them. I said, hey, hey, what are you doing chasing my daughters as they hid behind me? Then before the man could even answer, my oldest daughter said he grabbed my youngest daughter and told her to come with him. But then my oldest daughter pushed him back and grabbed my youngest daughter and said, don't put your dirty ass hands on my sister. And this man's response to my daughter is when I lose my shit and black out, like for part two. 
story time. So once upon a time in grade five, I was going through this really strange phenomenon where like five of my adult teeth decided to all come in at once. Now I already had this really weird obsession with when I had a loose tooth, I loved to like pluck it out of my face like berries off of a vine. So as you can imagine, sitting there with five loose teeth in my mouth felt like I was in an orchard on a hot summer's day. My brothers had just rewatched The Exorcist with me a few nights before while babysitting. So it's cinematic masterpiece was so ever fresh in my mind as I sat there not listening to my teacher drone on about numbers, secretly popping my teeth out with my tongue and letting my mouth fill with blood. Till I noticed my dear old classmate Tristane, who used to eat rulers and pick on me, was staring at me. So I looked him dead in the eyes, opened my mouth slowly and let all of the teeth and blood just dribble out onto the desk. Then I said in a low grumble, you will die tonight. He started screaming and then I had to go to church. Imagine falling victim to a demented serial killer and being the only one of his victims that survives to tell the tale. In September of 1992, Jennifer Aspenson was a young 19-year-old nurse living in Palm Springs, California. She had just missed her bus while buying candy for the disabled girls that she worked with at a nearby hospital. During this time, a serial killer who had brutally murdered five women was on the hunt. Jennifer was visibly distressed because it was 9.50 p.m. and she worked a 10 to 6 shift. A man pulled up to her after noticing her distress and offered her a ride. At first, Jennifer turned him down, but she had already showed a blade to work three nights in a row and she was told if it happened again that she'd be fired. As he started to drive away, Jennifer changed her mind and got in his car. When he dropped her off, he asked her for her number. She didn't want to blatantly reject him, so she gave him a fake number and went to work. When Jennifer gets off at 6 a.m., she sees his car waiting for her. He asked her if she'd like to get breakfast and she tells him that she couldn't. He then talks her into at least giving her a ride home and she accepts. As they're driving, he pulls out the number she had given him and his whole persona shifts. He screams at her that he called the number and some old lady answered. He instantly bashes her head in the dashboard and ties her wrist behind her back. Jennifer is in complete shock and terrified when she sees the gun. He puts her seat all the way back and drives her out to the desolate desert. As Jennifer watches the telephone poles pass, the realization sets him that she might never leave this desert. When he stops, he uses his weapon to tear off her clothing. Jennifer recalls the look in his eyes being dark and of pure rage. At this moment, she knows that he's done this before. He tried to assault her, but he couldn't perform, which only angered him more. The level of violence escalated as he strangled her. As her vision went blurry, she felt an overwhelming calm sensation wash over her as everything went white. Suddenly, she felt herself come to again and watched as he was pounding on her chest. She was ready to accept death and just told him to do it. However, he wasn't finished with her and wanting to continue her torture, he grabs a bag of sharp weapons out of the trunk. She refuses to die being cut up into pieces and tries to escape. He follows after her and catches her, dragging her by her hair through cacti and gravel. He put her in the trunk, battered and bloody, and starts driving. In that moment, Jennifer remembered her grandmother and prayed to God for help. She recalls getting a hysterical amount of energy and splitting the twine apart that was holding her wrist together. She then manages, by some miracle, to tear through the latch of the trunk and open it. This is when the man pulls over, gets out, and slams the trunk shut again. 